is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome visitors and church family. We are so honored that you joined us. And this morning, if you have a heavy heart or you've been feeling overwhelmed by everything going on in the world right now, you are not crazy. That is a very normal feeling to be feeling. Now, I love how many times in the Psalm, David cries out and he says, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. And he's speaking to his own soul at this point. He's saying, soul, put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David is strengthening himself in the Lord. And today, if you have a heavy heart, I encourage you to strengthen yourself in the Lord. Sing out loud, sing praise out loud, not in a whisper, but out loud. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us and all that you've done for us. And today we want you to know that this is for you. Everything that we do, it's for you, Lord, that we want to lift up your name. And we pray, God, that you would bring a sense of peace over our country and over the whole world as people are so um, feeling angry and scared and frustrated and so much is going on with illness and with uh, civil liberties and politics and all of these things swirling around at the same time. Lord, we're asking, help us, help us, we pray. And we believe that you can use all of this for your glory and all of this for the betterment of your people. And Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Turn around to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Hi friends, we are so happy you've joined us in worship today. You are the beloved of God and we are thankful that you've chosen to be a part of this church family. As we continue celebrating our first 50 years of broadcasting, Hannah and I wanna remind you that you are the reason that our mission continues to go around the world. You have provided the inspiration, the hope, the support for like a half century long journey and this is just the beginning. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Life is unpredictable, but even when we encounter twists and turns on the road, Jesus keeps our feet steady and invites us to fix our eyes on him as he cheers us on from the finish line. God never changes and his brilliance illuminates our path and empowers us to shine his light on those walking in darkness. In a world full of fear and uncertainty, especially with the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic this year, people need to hear the good news that they are not just a number, but that there is a God who knows and loves them and cares for them. Together, you and I can continue delivering that message as we invite our neighbors and the nations to embark on a journey of possibility that embraces God's beloved. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. Our first 50 years have been a journey, and we're excited to see how God is going to impact the world through this ministry in the next 50 years. My prayer is that you will continue standing with us so we can run our race strong and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is waiting at the finish line. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. I walk with God from this day on. His loving hand will lead me on. I pray to Him this humble plea. Help me, Lord, come close. 
I'm weak, but my Lord is strong. He watches over me all day long. I walk with for the message, 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 17. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. Holy Spirit, give us the power to be fearless of the world's judgment that we may be free to fearlessly pursue you. Amen. At the mention of his name, walls crumble, lives are changed. In the midst of life, Temptations, he's there to see us through. This man of which I speak is here today for you and me. His name is Jesus, but you can call him as you please. Call him.
Bob Goff is an author, speaker, and professor who wants to see people fully embrace and do life the way Jesus wants us to. He's also the founder of Love Does, a nonprofit organization that supports human rights in some third world countries. His new book, Dream Big, is based off of his Dream Big Framework workshops, which focus on how we can make our dreams a reality. Please welcome Bob Goff. Bob, hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks a million. Great to be talking to you, Bobby. You live in California, right? I do. I live in San Diego, and we just bought this camp. It used to be called Oak Bridge, but now it's called the Oaks, and we've been working on it for about seven months. It's been a big dream. That's awesome. It's been I, an ambition to create a place. Didn't you use? I went there? to Oak Ridge. I did. I went to Indian <laughs> Village first, and then I went to Oak Ridge afterwards, all through junior high. I kissed my first girl there on the swing under the oh, tree. Yes, I did. Get out of camp. Can I see it? Can you like turn it around and uh, like we can see where you are? Yeah. Totally. Come on, get in here. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start scanning. That's awesome. For your initials everywhere. Yeah. That is rad. Every oak tree that has your initials on it. <laughs> now I know the backstory. That is so cool. So did you, you bought Oak Ridge, didn't you? Yeah, I did. We uh, decided I, uh, my ambition has been to be a grandpa. If I've been since junior high school, since the time you kissed that girl. <laughs> and uh, but I finally became a grandpa, and uh, what I want to do now is just be available. Yeah. And I think some, there's power in availability, and so that's the way it is with ambitions. You just need to know what you want, why you want it, decide what you're going to do about it. Well, that's cool. We're so excited to have you. You have a lot of big fans on the staff here. So many of us, including uh, me, we love your books. Of course, everybody knows your first book. Uh, uh, love does and then the second book is it everybody always is that what it's called yeah that's it so, both great great books and you're such a great like storyteller and I, I love how it's I guess it's a nonfiction book but it feels like you get wrapped up in your personal story of how to love people and I just we just love I love the balloon thing you have so many ways that you just bring so much joy and happiness to people's lives well, I think that's what uh, what happens. Jesus said he never spoke to anybody without telling them a story. Yeah. And I know why, because now when I'm walking around here, I'm going to be thinking about your experience at Oak Bridge as a junior high kid. <laughs> and that's what it is. When we talk, I think Jesus, the smartest theologian ever, and he points to two sheep and he says, it's like when one of those gets away. And everybody goes like, I know exactly what that's like. That is so awesome. <laughs> I when it happens. <laughs> that's great. You know, uh, one question I wanted to ask you, I want to talk about your new book. But before I do, one thing that always is so interesting to me, I mean, for those who don't know you, you're a, you, you were a, an attorney, a professor and stuff, but I think you're really well known more as an author now, I mean, and a speaker, but um, you put your cell phone number at the back of every book you write, which is crazy because you've sold, I mean, you've sold millions of books, haven't you? And, yeah, and people, and it's like your million. cell phone. So like if somebody buys your book and they flip to the back and they find your cell phone and they call, there's a good chance you're just going to answer and talk to them. What is it's that like? It must be crazy. crazy. Yeah, there was this young guy that called me a little while ago and he said, Bob, I want to know the one thing about relationships. I'm like, you haven't had a girlfriend yet, have you? <laughs> uh, because there's actually many things. It'd be like asking an astronaut, what's the one thing about getting to the moon? It'd be like, I don't know, arrive. But what I would do if I want to get to the moon is I'd find somebody who'd done it before and I'd spend a ton of time talking about who was in the capsule and then I would just get the moon in the window and keep pointing at it. So whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, that people want the most, get it in the window. If it's your faith, get it in the window. But you don't, you yeah. can't still do that, right? You don't still answer the phone, do you? And people- Oh, I do, yeah. You still do? How many calls? You must get tons of calls a day. What about, when do you get time for Bob? I mean, aren't you oh, always- it's crazy. But here's the deal. This would not work for Sweet Maria Goff at all. Yeah. But actually, I just noticed that Jesus was constantly available. Yeah. And that doesn't make me Jesus. It makes me like Jesus. Yeah. And so for we can't decide how tall we'll be or short we'll be. You can't decide how wealthy you'll be, but you can decide how available you'll be. And I just decided to be Uber available yeah. <laughs> before there was even Uber. Yeah. So <laughs> it's actually been terrific. And, and you I, might say, I, you might say, Maria, your wife, sweet Maria, as you call her in your books, uh, you might say that she maybe isn't called to do that, but maybe you are. She's called to be available in different ways, but this is a way that, I mean, it brings you joy, right? I mean, it's fun for you to yeah. do this. Oh, totally. And the crazy thing, sweet Maria and I, when they said we got married, she finally relented. 
and uh, and uh, they said the two of us will become one. She thought we were going to become her. <laughs> I'm like, oh heck no! But here's the deal: I'm not trying to be like her, and she's not trying to be like me. We're trying to be like Jesus. Amen. And for me, I see His availability, and those are the people that have influenced me the most. It wasn't the smartest people, it was the people who were most available. Hey Amen, that's so good, Bob, thank you. Well, I'm really excited to read your new book. I haven't read it yet, I know it'll be awesome. The first, I read both of your other books and they're just great, they're so fun and encouraging and inspiring. And uh, this is a perfect title for you. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple title, it's called Dream Big. And where did you, what's the book about and where did you come up with this idea to write this book? I mean. This is a crazy time, I, you know, I mean. It is, I think uh, so many people are just worn out. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been whipsawed. It's gonna take a lot of couch time for us to yeah. sort all this out. But one of the things that will disappear when you're a little stressed out is your ambitions, your dreams. And I just wanna get back to building that rocket ship that was supposed to be your life. Like, yeah. uh, And sometimes you had a dream, let's say it was something that you had a ambition for the first 12 years of your life. And then uh, Billy uh, said no. Like you applied for the job or you tried for the, the whatever it was that was important to you. And then you feel like you say, God shut the door. It'd be like, that did not happen at all. Billy said no. That yeah. was the only transaction that happened. So I want to say, what were your uh, beautiful ambitions? And then ask not what do you want, but just why do you want it? Mm -hmm. Because if you want applause, I mean, join the circus. But if you want Jesus, then find people who are hurting. Yeah. And then have these uh, authentic conversations with them. And in taking an interest in their ambition, you'll actually find your ambition. I, and so this was an ambition of mine. I'm a grandpa now. You know, it's crazy. I've got a grandson. He only knows one word, apple. <laughs> and so an apple is an apple. I'm an apple. Sweet Maria is an apple. A car is an apple. I'm hoping by the time he gets to high school, he knows two words. Um, but I want to find more words to describe the things that you've wanted for a really long time. Don't just say, I want to be happy, because me too. But just say, what would make you happy? Yeah. I mean, really, really, what's going to outlast you? And that's where the good stuff seems to happen. Yeah. When I hear you talking about this, I can think of all of the many people who, you know, grew up in pretty strict religious households. And they have this you know, virtue, and it is a virtue, to be humble, to be, you know, a learner. But sometimes some churches go so far with that that they almost, like, they, it's like it's almost bad to dream. It's bad to, or like you said, even use the phrase, be happy, things like that. There's this religious, uh, 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 I feel like, baggage that a lot of people carry. And they, they get a little like, when they hear a, a Christian, a pastor, or someone like you say, dream big, they're, they're a little bit like, oh, I don't know if that's okay. I mean, what do you say to that as a believer? You know, I mean, I, I'm sure you've experienced that from some folks, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there'll be some pushback because they don't actually know where we're coming from, like yeah. what happens. I had some big dreams for some little girls in Afghanistan that the Taliban won't let learn how to read and write because they're girls. And that just ticked me off. So instead of signing a petition, I just started buying tickets to Afghanistan. <laughs> so I'm in and out there constantly. And we've got two schools and we're teaching little girls how to read and write. But here's the thing, and I know you guys get this. God isn't dazzled when you go across the ocean. What blows his hair back is when you go across the street. Yeah. Love God with your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor right here where you are. That's where the good stuff happens. But do it in both places. It isn't binary, and I'm not doing it because I want applause. I want to do it because Matthew 25 said, hungry people, thirsty people, sick people, strange people, naked people, and people in jail. Did you know this? I teach at Pepperdine Law School, but I also teach at San Quentin Penitentiary. You should come with me sometime. I will. It'll blow your mind. I will. <laughs> it's awesome. Wait, yeah, wait the law school guy. or the penitentiary? Just kidding. Come to the penitentiary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a guy got out and he told me that uh, he's standing on the outside of the wall at San Quentin. I'm like, there's not like a trail of bed sheets tied together, right? <laughs> and he, he was holding a phone and he called me. He'd never held a cell phone before. And he said, Bob, I'm out. And I said, in this big moment, I'm like, what are you thinking? And you know what he said? I've got pockets. <laughs> uh. What the heck? Because you can't have pockets 
in San Quentin in a particularly <laughs> Hemway-esque moment, I told them to be really careful about what you put in your pockets. That's what I would say to people who have big ambitions. Yeah. Sometimes you've carried all the shame and guilt. You got more baggage than Delta Airlines. And I would say, be careful about what you put in your pocket to so just let some yeah. of these things go, bring them to Jesus and to say, that's old me. I'm a new creation. I'm new Bob. I've spent 61 long years being old Bob. He's on the bus. New Bob. That's it's great. Like, oh, Chris Lipkin, I get in with Bobby. That's <laughs> awesome, Bob. I appreciate it. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting as a Schuler, you know, we are big dreamers. My grandpa, one of his, my favorite lines from him that I have seen so true in my life is he said, if you build your dream, your dream will build you. I think there's really something about that, that that dreaming brings hope and life to people, especially now when we're all in this lockdown with COVID-19 and all this despair over the abuse of people of color in America. And, and then on the other side, there's sometimes riots and looting and there's just so much anxiety and worry. It's hard to dream right now. But I think that if we, Amer if we as Americans of all stripes can, can come together and begin dreaming again and become, become that industrialized, visionary kind of people that I think we are always meant to be, I think that'll make a big difference in people's lives. Yeah, I think we just call that out of one another. I know you do that. You're calling out from people. You're giving them new yeah. names. When Peter blow, blew it, Jesus didn't call him a blow it. He said, you're a rock. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to do this whole thing. And so to call that dream back out of you, God gave it to you. Let's dust that thing off. See, drive it around the block. Amen. Well, the book is called Dream Big, and the author is Bob Goff. And I want to recommend it. the book is available anywhere books are sold. Go get it today if you need some encouragement. Bob, thank you so much for joining hey. us today. Great to see you. Come on back up here. I will. Thanks again, brother. We appreciate you and enjoy that weather today. All right. See you. Take care. Bye. Hallelujah. Doesn't mean that much to me, the things I tell you. I'm shocked the least of these king of sinners. I've been crowned, maybe that proves I'm at the bottom With nothing left to lose I heard your story How you died there on that tree I gotta tell you I'm not sure that I believe still I come And I'm here just as I am I hope you'll take me Broken hearted man. If you're not a stranger to sorrow, if you can understand all my pain, then give me strength for a day and for tomorrow. And I used to see the glory of the coming. Coming.
joined us in worship today. You are the beloved of God and we are thankful that you've chosen to be a part of this church family. As we continue celebrating our first 50 years of broadcasting, Hannah and I want to remind you that you are the reason that our mission continues to go around the world. You have provided the inspiration, the hope, the support for like a half century long journey and this is just the beginning. Philippians 3:14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Life is unpredictable, but even when we encounter twists and turns on the road, Jesus keeps our feet steady and invites us to fix our eyes on him as he cheers us on from the finish line. God never changes and his brilliance illuminates our path and empowers us to shine his light on those walking in darkness. In a world full of fear and uncertainty, especially with the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic this year, people need to hear the good news that they are not just a number, but that there is a God who knows and loves them and cares for them. Together, you and I can continue delivering that message as we invite our neighbors and the nations to embark on a journey of possibility that embraces God's beloved. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. Our first 50 years have been a journey, and we're excited to see how God is going to impact the world through this ministry in the next 50 years. My prayer is that you will continue standing with us so we can run our race strong and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is waiting at the finish line. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. When you are teaching your children, you know, I know you've gone through this, you have four daughters, right? You never know what is the one thing that you might say on a given day that's gonna be the thing that registers. And that's why I think if there's any uh, advice that I like to give myself all the time is, and, and Linda and I both talk about this, is to try and measure your words with your kids. And if, if I can accomplish that, then... And just stay in, mentally in tune with God, saying, Dear God, don't let me blow it. Help me to say the right thing.
Stand up with me. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. We're in a series on names of God for you. You know, God calls you a lot of things. He calls you favorite. He calls you beloved. He calls you chosen. He just calls you, calls you to tasks, and calls you to be his Soldier to work on his behalf, his builder, his helper, his messenger. And all of these names we can find through the scripture. And they all inform us about God's posture towards us. That it's a posture of love and care. That it's a posture of kindness and mercy. It's a God who roots for us as a dad roots for his kids. But today I want to talk about one of my favorite ones, one that hopefully I exemplify, but not too much. And that is that God calls us a peculiar people. God calls you peculiar. God calls you weird. And that's a good thing. There are lots of people who want to be weird, but nobody is weirder than Portland. Let's start there. Come with me to a city in Oregon called Portland. I've only been there once and it is weird. It's not as weird as you might think, but the people are lovely. But there is this slogan that says, keep Portland weird. And what they mean by that is Portland is a culture of expressionism, individuality, art, and weirdness. And it's sort of the weirdness thing that keeps it all together. As long as Portland stays weird, you as a, what would you call it, a Port, Portlander? I'm looking at, you know, nobody knows. A person from Portland. Uh, then you will have the freedom in its weirdness to express yourself however you like. Here's some examples of Portland's weirdness. Uh, in lieu of graffiti, Portland chooses to do what's called yarn bombing. That's when you take a public piece of property and you cover it in, in uh, yarn. I love it. I think it's really pretty and, and kind of cute. Basically, it looks like Nickelodeon took over. Oh, and this guy, though. But this guy is great. 
This is the Unipiper. He's a unicyclist who plays bagpipes that shoot flames out of them while usually dressed up like Darth Vader with a cape. If you're asking why, just read the sign behind him. The why is, we want to stay weird. By the way, the Unipiper changed his outfit for COVID-19. Here you can see him spraying Lysol while wearing it. OK, why am I talking about Portland being weird? Because in many ways, you understand why people from Portland want their city to stay weird. They want it to be, my parents lived in, for a long time in a place called Laguna Beach here by, which is another like kind of artist colony. And it's also a weird place. And you can see how there is this fear that if too much corporate interest or too much business type stuff or too much of these things come in, that there will be an exchange, that in exchange for good things like more jobs and maybe better jobs and a better, maybe even a better economy and more money, we'll lose something special about what makes us Laguna Beach. We'll lose something special about what makes us Portland. And I think that the church would do well to think in those terms sometimes. After all, God does call us a peculiar people, doesn't he? He calls us a weird people. And yet so often it feels like the church is becoming less and less weird. It's been feeling more and more normal. And I'm not sure I'm excited about that. When you look at the early church coming out of Pentecost, when the church was full of the Holy Spirit, it was bizarre. Last week we talked about all of these races and ethnicities and barbarians and Scythian horse riders and Greeks and Gauls and Celts and slaves and all of these people coming into, pouring into the church, loving one another, caring for one another. These are people that weren't even supposed to associate with each other and here they are gathering and loving and caring for one another. The Roman Empire said of the early Christians all sorts of things. They thought they were cannibals because when they would gather, they would eat the body of Christ. They thought they were incestual because husbands and wives would refer to each other as brother and sister. And of course, none of those things are true, but they, 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 the outside world didn't get the inner life of the church. And quite frankly, Peter, the leader of the church, wasn't bothered by that at all. That's why he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, weird, freaky people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I think that the church is always having people within it who are a little bit of the outsiders that are really good for the church. And I want to encourage you in your faith to be a little more like them, to be a little peculiar and a little weird and just be okay with that. It was weird because I think as pastors, we desperately want to reach everyday people. We want to reach normal people. We want to reach people who are accountants and dentists and stay-at-home moms and taxi drivers. We want to reach normal people and show them that this good news, that this gospel is for them. And in that attempt, I think sometimes we as pastors forget that there's also this alluring life in the church that we keep hidden we, we, it's a little light. You know, we keep this little light under the bushel. And I remember before I was a pastor, knowing all of these huge ministries and, and, and you know, I listened to podcasts all the time and, and had favorite authors. And, and, and as I started working at the Crystal Cathedral back when it was doing well and, and it had a lot of influence, as a young man, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of these famous ministers and even now, of course, I especially rub elbows with these guys 
in various conventions and gatherings and think tanks and stuff all the time. And one of the most surprising things to me was this. You basically can take every preacher, priest, minister, pastor, and you can kind of boil them down into one of three groups. You've got your normal ones. That makes up most of them. You know, the normal, that's the guy that you would hire to run a store. You know, the guy that you would hire to run for office or, or you know, you, he's a responsible chap that can take care of things and you're, you're happy to have him in your Rolodex. But then you have these other two types. The weird one who is hearing things from God or speaking in tongues or, you know, laying in the streets with poor people or saying things that you're like, oh, I'm not comfortable with that. And you've got the grouchy get off my lawn ones, you know, who are always like judging everybody and are always angry and you're never good enough. And it was so interesting to meet the guys from these groups in person, behind doors, without any tapes rolling. And what I found was that the weird ones were my favorites. You know what else was a surprise? Well, first, the weird ones, they were the ones that in person seemed truly full of God. They were the ones that if you were in a corner, you want them praying for you. They were the ones that when they spoke, you really, you really felt like maybe God was, was saying something. Another big surprise was that the grouchy get off my lawn ones were also in many ways seemed to be full of the spirit. That was a surprise. You know me, I'm like the, I, I feel like I'm a super nice guy. I, I, I love people. I'm always very positive. I smile a lot. Maybe, maybe I, I don't have a realistic view of myself, but that's how I think of myself anyway. And so I don't always like the grouchy get off my lawn pastors. But in real life, they also seemed full of the spirit in their own way. It was the normal ones that bugged me. It was the famous, influential, normal pastors that something rubbed me wrong about them. And I, I don't want to get into it because there's nothing wrong with being normal, I guess. It just felt like maybe there was this ego. Like there was one guy, a big pastor who was at this table full of people. You know, there were like maybe 12 ministers there and we're eating together. And this guy was like super famous pastor. And he was just like one-upping everybody. Like there was one guy who was talking about a ministry he was doing for the poor. And then this guy would interrupt him and tell him how he did like 10 times as many. And then there was another guy who was like, oh, we do this thing in Israel. And he would say, oh, we do this thing and we do more. And like as he's doing it, he's like eating chicken and it's like getting all over his face and his shirt. Anyway, I, I, I just found that the, the weird, I found that as I get to know Christians, the weirder they are, the more I like them. I don't know if that makes it good or bad, but I'm just saying for me as a believer, I want to be around believers who are peculiar. Maybe you've got people who are like, who look down at you, people who talk bad about you because of your faith. Maybe you don't always feel like you fit in. I want you to know that might be a good thing. I believe that if we take the command of the Shema seriously, which says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If you love the Lord in this way, some people might find you a little odd. In fact, being odd might be evidence that you're doing it right. You look at the women and the men of God throughout the scriptures who chased after God with all their heart. And you find people who are peculiar. People who didn't care about fitting in. Daniel, when an edict is passed that no one should pray, begins praying in his window morning, noon, and night. Wants people to know he's not embarrassed about his faith. Elijah, who runs up and down Mount Carmel and, you know, calls out to God. And John the Baptist, how about him? Covered in the skins of animals, eating locusts and honey. Jesus says to his disciples, when you went out to the wilderness, 
What did you go to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What did you go to see? Did you go to see a man and dressed in fine clothes? No, that's for kings. You went to see and to find a prophet. And that's who John the Baptist was. An odd cat for sure. I bet if we had John the Baptist here today, he'd probably, we'd probably assign him some kind of mental illness or something. See, the word holy in the Bible means set apart. You want to know why God gives all of those bizarre commands to the Hebrew people and the Torah? Things like, don't mix two types of cloth. Like, who cares? Who cares if you mix wool and cotton? It's because he wants them to be set apart. He wants them to be different. He wants them to stand out. Because a light, in order to be seen, must shine. It can't be hidden. It can't be under a bushel. This is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I don't know anybody, including myself, when people have gossiped about me, put me down, cursed me, persecuted me, I look in the mirror and I rejoice. I want you to know, the weirder you are, the more I like you. That's just how it is. The weirder you are, the more I like you. As long as you're not like a mean person, I just love people who live a life so much for God that they're not worried about what other people think about them. And by the way, when you're around people who are not so straight-laced, it's easier to relax and be yourself. So I love you. That's all I'm saying. Of course, the most famous story of a peculiar person I think of is the famous story of David dancing naked before the Lord. I'll tell you that story real quick. You know, first of all, David didn't dance naked. We'll get to that in a minute too. But it begins like this. David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the new, the new capital of Israel, of Judah. He's bringing the Ark. And the Ark of the Covenant, you guys remember the Ark of the Covenant, right? We've all seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Moses puts this together according to the law of the Torah. And it holds three things. It holds the Ten Commandment tablets. It holds the staff of Aaron. And it holds a pot of manna. Wouldn't it be awesome to find that thing? And it is meant to be carried on poles and respected. And the Ark of the Covenant is dangerous, as we also know from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember when we open it and all the Nazis get melted? Close your eyes. Okay. It really is dangerous. It's so full of God's glory that anybody who touches it, you know, touches the actual part, would die. And it's supposed to be carried on these wooden poles, and the Ark itself is supposed to be the throne of God, God the, a picture of God's presence and authority. As they begin to carry the throne of God towards Jerusalem, David has 30,000 men, young men, dancing and celebrating with him. Now, picturing 30,000 men is a lot. Staples Center, for example, holds 20,000 people. So just add 50% to Staples Center. That's how many people are in this procession to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, into Jerusalem. It's this very big deal. And they make a terrible mistake. A guy named Uzzah, because it's hard to carry an ark, puts the ark on a cart. So he's sinned, he's broken Torah, the way you're supposed to treat this thing. And so it's bouncing along the road, and an ox falls, and Uzzah either tries to keep it from falling, but I think the picture actually is more like when you get a cart stuck in a path. Now again, if they were carrying it, this wouldn't be a problem. So the cart is stuck in the path, and kind of like when you're pushing like a truck to get it out of the thing, Uzzah maybe leans his shoulder. I'm just, imagine this doesn't actually say this, but it it says he was trying to get it out. So I picture him like pushing or using his back to kind of, you know, pry God's throne out of this thing. And when it happens, it says God's wrath burned against him, and he died right in that instance. 
Imagine the air going out of the room when this happens. Everybody's celebrating, there's music, there's celebration, it's fun. And then this guy tries to shove the ark out of a, a pothole or something and dies. Someone everybody knows and everybody freaks out and is terrified. David, it says, and this is such a classic thing. David gets angry at God first and then he gets scared. How could you do that to Uzzah, a good man? Yeah, then he gets scared and he says to himself, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He asks himself, maybe the Lord's blessing has left me. Maybe it's over. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you feel like God's blessing has left you. I want you to know it hasn't. God's about to pour out great blessing in your life. And so, and this seems like another classic David move. David decides... To, because he doesn't want to bring it into Jerusalem in case it kills everybody, he picks this guy, Obed-Edom, and decides to put it in his house. And just to see, like, you know, if Obed burns up, then we did the right thing. But if Obed's okay, then maybe we'll bring it into the city. So they leave it at this guy's house. I don't know what that looked like. I guess they just brought it into his house and they just, like, had the Ark of the Covenant in his kitchen or something. Because <laughs> this is in his house. So I don't know what that meant. But, but then... And then it says, after three months, it says that God just immensely blessed this guy, Obed, and his whole household, which in the Old Testament almost always means wealth and health and prosperity and life. And his farms are going well and just things are going well for him. And people are just like, whoa, Obed is prospering. Obed is blessed. And so David goes, I got to get the ark. Let's go down and get it. And so they go and they get the ark to carry it back in Jerusalem. They're like, God's you know, presence and blessing hasn't left. And this time, David, instead of wearing his kingly outfit and his crown and his robe and looking magisterial and powerful, he wears linens and an ephod, which means he dresses like a priest. And he carries it in a sacred way where there's still music being played, and every six feet they sacrifice a fatted calf, which is like the most expensive thing in the world. Every six feet, another sacrifice. And, it's, and they carry it, of course. It's not in a cart. But still, David, dressed up like a, like a priest, is like dancing. It says, it uses almost the same language that we use about loving God. It says he danced with all his might. It was like with everything he had in him, he just danced before the Lord because he was so thrilled that God was with him and for him and that God was coming to Jerusalem and God was going to save and preserve his people, that all he could do was dance like crazy. And everybody's celebrating. And the ark comes into the city and David, you know, in the linens and in a fod and his hair all messed up and sweating everywhere, still dancing, still rejoicing, still singing the halal. His wife, a princess named Michal, looks down from her window at her husband who's supposed to be regal and kingly and dignified and sees a man sweating and dancing and celebrating before the Lord, not naked, but not dressed like a king, but lowly. And she has contempt for him. Her father would have not, never done that. Her father, Saul, who was a regal, handsome, tall king, would have never done something like that. Here's this husband of mine. David establishes the throne of God in the tabernacle and he lays down the sacrifices and he blesses the people and gives them all of these foods and cakes and things. And then he goes up to his own house to bless his children and his wife. And when he enters the house, his wife, with fire in her eyes, says, How the king of Israel distinguishes himself dancing half naked before the servants like a vulgar man. And David's response, he looks at her and he says, God chose me. I will become even more undignified than this. I 
will be even more humiliated than this for the Lord. We need some respectable Christians to let loose a little bit and take the lid off. Look, when I talked this morning about this, I'm not encouraging you to be weird as much as I'm encouraging you to love God so much, to live for him with such fire and such passion and such a desire that you don't care about what other people think. You don't care if other people choose you. You care if God chooses you. And I think it's this thing that is most alluring about our faith is people that are just overflowing with the spirit, overflowing with life and overflowing with love. Don't worry about being weird. Don't worry at all. Just love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and he'll take care of the rest. Father, we love you. We thank you. I pray for everyone who feels like they don't fit in, like they don't belong. I pray, Lord, that they would just continue to seek after you with all their heart. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.